sorry. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start with into China part one. Um, as always, our um, rules are, are essentially the same. So you wanna make sure you stay focused while you're here, participate when you're asked, use the chat for lesson purposes only, um, make sure that you're always respectful to everyone. Um, do not leave the session early, follow um, the Microsoft team rules, which in case you aren't familiar, turn your camera off and microphone. If you wish to speak, click the raise hand button. Once Mr. Privatera calls your name, you can unmute yourself and speak. And then when you're done, you can remute uh, yourself and then um, lower your hand. And then as always, of course, the most important rule of all is to make sure you learn lots while you're here. So um, with the um, learning goal for this particular lesson, students will be able to explain the major contributions of the Shang Dynasty, interpret the importance of family um, in the Chinese culture, describe the teachings of Confucius, um, and how he used it to influence the government and explain what the symbol of the yin yang represents. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about the Huang River. So um, this is kind of where Chinese civilization begins. And you can see that back in module two, we talked about um, really three major ancient river civilizations. So we talked about Mesopotamia, then Egypt, and then the Indus River Valley. But um, in reality, there was a, um, a fourth one too. And that fourth one is actually the, the Huang River, which is um, in China, in modern day China. So we're kind of gonna start by going back in time a little bit um, to the earliest Chinese um, and their civilization developed along um, this river. So a powerful river valley civilization arose in ancient China. Um, and um, we and it was called the Huang River Civilization. It developed around the same time as the Indus River Valley, um, and it had cities, it had a stable government, and its society was really complex. Uh, the, in these ways, it was kind of like Egypt and Mesopotamia and the Indus River Valley, but unlike those civilizations, its trade with distant lands was very limited. This led China to create its own culture and kind of approaches to solving problems um, in, a, in a very different way than a lot of the other uh, ancient civilizations. So the, the Huang River means yellow river, uh, and it gets that name because the river actually looks like it's yellow. Um, the color comes from the vast amounts of yellow silt carried by the waters. Um, the Huang picks up uh, the silt and flows through nearby um, kind of deserts and plateaus. And it, the silt is a very rich looking um, yellow color that's just really perfect for, for farming. So the geography of ancient China is really, really isolated. So we talked about that a little bit with the Indus River Valley, how it was surrounded by mountains. So the people were kind of isolated, but the mountains um, were still close by to some of these other civilizations. But China kind of has two things going for it. It's really isolated because of geography, and it's also really far away. So those two things allow it to develop really differently um, than a lot of the other civilizations we talked about. So you have much of China is covered by highlands or deserts. Um, in ancient times, these created really big barriers to, to travel, right? So it wasn't easy to cross a desert. Um, it's not today, but um, back then especially, that was the case. So one mountain range of the Himalayas formed a wall between China and India. Um, the Himalayas are the largest mountain chain um, in the world. So then you have the um, Telmachian Desert, and that's kind of um, kind of in the in the far western part of China, and that really limits trade with the Middle East and Europe. And then you have the Gobi Desert that's to the north, and that also kind of restricts trade um, in interactions with people from the north. So they basically have mountains and deserts kind of to the to the south. Um, west and north of them, and then you have the Pacific Ocean to the east of them. So they're really pretty isolated from the rest of the world. They did not have regular contact with some of these advanced cultures to the far west, um, and then kind of their ideas that spread among the other river civilizations did not reach them, and for this reason, they really create their own unique traditional um, way of life. So what led to the Shang Dynasty, kind of that the, the first kind of dynasty that we know of um, in the ancient uh, Chinese world? So families settled near rivers, and over time, the groups of these families chose to live and farm in the same place. 
they formed these villages. The rich soil helped them produce lots of food, populations soared, and villages grew into cities. Strong leaders kind of arose to help organize, govern, and kind of defend these cities. Uh, one such leader gained control of the number of nearby groups, and he was the first of the Shang kings. Uh, like the Egyptians in the Nile River Valley, ancient China was ruled by a series of dynasties. Um, the Shang was the first Chinese dynasty to appear in written records. Now, there may be one that came before this, but historians aren't 100% sure. So we like to kind of unofficially say that the Shang dynasty is the first dynasty um, in ancient China. So the Shang kings were warriors and they expanded their lands through conquest. The Shang army had as many as 5,000 men. They were well organized and well armed. Their bronze helmet, knives, axes, and bronze uh, tipped spears gave them the advantage over their nearby, over the surrounding people. So did their horse-drawn chariots. Warf warfare brought the kings and his nobles great wealth, and they brought power, which helped the dynasty survive. And then, like the Egyptians, the Shang king passed his, his um, control or his rule from son to, son to brother, from son to son, from, bleh, from father to son, or from brother to brother. Um, and kind of this method of holding power really worked well because the Shang dynasty lasts for about 600 years. So um, a civilization is, comp is a complex society and in China, in the Shang era, um, there the king held really the top rank, just like other ancient river civilizations. The Chinese did not view their kings as gods. Okay, so that's a little bit um, different than some of the other societies we talked about. The king was the most important and powerful person, but he wasn't a god. Um, a class of wealthy nobles kind of backed the king, priests too. They were part of this kind of upper class. The king's family and other elite members of society lived in kind of the walled areas of the capital city. And then the common people lived out kind of on the farms outside the walled areas. Um, so they were kind of at a distance, both physically and socially. Their small villages sat beyond the city walls. Um, and they kind of formed the, the lower class consisting of farmers, artisans, and they really kind of, their main task was to support not just themselves, but to support those elite people over in the walled cities. Um, their fields and shops um, that they produced foods and luxury goods for those upper classes. Slaves were not really a thing in China. They were a little bit, um, but not, not huge amounts of slaves by any, by any means. Um, they were mainly, um, the slaves that there were there were just mainly captives from, from war. So ancestors is a huge key um, belief. Go ahead, sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. What's your question? Um, my question is with the, why would the king nobles be higher than the king's family if it's literally the king's family? Well, I think, <laughs> I, I think even if you look at the US government today, the, 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 you know, the president's family isn't as high up as say, you know, the speaker of the house or other, other high up people. So I don't think that's abnormal. Um, Maria. Um, I have two questions. So um, my first one is why do they have dynasties and why are they important? So dynasties, like we, like I said before, is just kind of, um, it, it's 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 what the, the, the ruling family, it's the, that particular family's rule is their dynasty. So you might have several, you may have a dynasty with several generations of the same family, or we're gonna talk about one dynasty that was really just one generation, which was just one person who ruled. So okay. it's, just, it's just that kind of family's rule. Okay, and one last one is, um, in this like group, could like the women be like the household like person, or yeah. they could be like the king or something like that? China. Um, women do not really have the same rights as men. So women almost exclusively, no matter when we're talking about in China, would be just kind of the, the ones in charge of the household. Okay, thank okay. you. Yep. Uh, Rhea, then we're gonna cap questions because we got a lot to get through today. So Rhea, go ahead, what's your question? I was wondering, like do Egyptians have dynasties too? So Egyptians had, had dynasties as well. Um, this curriculum doesn't really go too much into the individual dynasties of Egypt like we do um, China, okay? And the, and the Chinese dynasties last, as far as over time in history, last a lot longer than the Egyptian ones, the Egyptian ones do. Okay. So ancestors thought, ancestors are a huge part of their, of their belief system. 
So whereas you see a lot of um, other cultures kind of worship uh, gods and things, in ancient China, one of their one of their big cornerstones of their of their spiritual beliefs deal with ancestors. So ancestors they thought had the power to make their lives better or worse. The Shang wanted to keep their ancestors happy, so they worshipped their ancestors um, as well as their gods. So ancestor worship involved making ritual sacrifices. These offerings included wine and, and, and cooked foods, as well as animals and maybe even human beings. That would be very small. Um, the king, as a, and, um, as a high priest, often performed these rituals. Shang kings also talked to their ancestors, um, and they did this through these oracle bones. And the king might have asked, will we win the battle, or is this a good time to plant our crops? The priest chose kind of a flat animal bone or a tortoise shell, and um, he heated the oracle bone until it cracked. The king interpreted the cracks as to read the ancestor's response. So how these bones cracked in the fire was kind of how, um, almost like palm reading, right? So you'd read the cracks in your palm. So this, they would read the cracks in the, in, in the bones, and that would kind of give them their response from their ancestors. And then the scribe often wrote the answer um, on these oracle bones with kind of a sharp, uh, instrument. So some of the contributions um, to, from the Shang dynasty would be writing. So oracle bones show that the Shang had their own form of writing. Like writing in Mesopotamia, it was based on pictures, and each picture stood for a word. We call these pictures characters. The Shang writing had about 2,500 characters. Today, the Chinese language has about 70,000 characters. Um, they invented a calendar. So the Shang also had a calendar um, to create it. They studied the moon and the sun. Their calendar has 12 months and 365.25 days per year. It was more precise than the ones used by the other great civilizations that we talked about. The Shang figured out that a month is 29.53 days long. Scientists today have a very similar number for the exact length of a, of a month. So very, very advanced for their time. Silk is a huge contribution that we'll talk about over and over again when it comes to the Chinese. So long before the Shang Dynasty, Chinese farmers raised silkworms, these tiny little worms that I'm pretty sure are, you know, hang out in, in trees, essentially. Um, and they turned the silkworms' cocoons into a fine silk cloth. If any of you have ever um, had the pleasure of owning something silk, right, it's a very soft um, material. Usually it's kind of an expensive material, but it's very comfortable, very soft. In Shang cities, silk making was an industry. Weavers made silk um, in workshops just outside the city walls. Metals were also a big thing in the Shang Dynasty. So the Shang Dynasty arose during the Bronze Age. Its skilled crafters learned how to mix copper and tin and make bronze. With this metal, um, using a process called uh, bronze casting, they formed bowls and, and pots. Priests used most of these containers for religious rituals. They were also um, designed Designs on these objects were kind of known to be beautiful. Uh, bronze crafters made bells, uh, bronze rings, weapons, and tools. And then for the economy, so agriculture was really the big thing once again for the for the um, Shang Dynasty and the Huang River. Um, so uh, agriculture played a key role in the economy. Farmers provided food for themselves and members of the upper class. Um, in the cooler north of the Huang River, most farmers kind of grew mullet or a type of grain. In the southern part, they grew, getting closer to the Chang River, they grew um, rice. So Shang traders had a surplus of grain to offer in trade, and they had bronze objects, pottery, and silk. Uh, through barter, they acquired kind of tortoise shells from the Chang River and um, cowrie shells from kind of the southern seacoast. So they used kind of shells as, um, as a currency sometimes too, but usually it's just kind of bartering is how they traded. The Shang traded to obtain copper and tin for making bronze. Um, these came from kind of far off mining regions um, along with some other material. Another one was jade. So expert carvers turned the yellowish or greenish stone into beautiful objects. The Shang nobles valued these kind of jade objects really highly. Um, and lots of times they were often buried with their, with their owners. So jade was a very kind of precious metal to them. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the quiz part. So, but first, um, let's see, McKenzie, you have another question? I can't see the slide. Then sign out and sign back in. Okay. Um, Alejandro. 
My question is, um, how did people in the Shang Dynasty decide who they would sacrifice? When so I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too hung up on the sacrifice thing. It, like it says it in the readings, but but it's not really what they're known for at all. So did they do it? They sure, I'm sure they did. Um, but was that? It's not like the Aztecs where that's like a big thing that they're known for doing. Okay, so the answer is I don't really know because I don't really think that they're that they had a lot of that going on. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, Brianna, quickly, then we're going to move on to the to the quiz part. Should I be worried about not being in the team for this class or no? No, don't worry about it. I don't. Set up. Okay. Okay, so. So how did the Huang River um, civilization develop differently from the other River Valley civilizations? It, its trade with India brought goods um, as well as new ideas. Kind of its mining industry allowed it to create weapons and tools. Its location limited contact with other advanced cultures. Its army helped it expand through conquest. Maria, what do you think? I think it's D. It's armies helped to expand through conquest. Okay, there was a little bit of that, um, but that's not really the main. That's not really what helped it kind of develop. Um, so, Raya, what do you think? C. Good C. Remember, it's geography, right? The mountains and the deserts and the ocean kind of kept it isolated, so they didn't have a lot of contact with other people. They developed independent. So how are the civilizations of the Huang River Valley and the Nile River Valley similar? So China in, in, in Egypt, how are they similar? Both are known for building pyramids. Both arose in desert regions. Both uh, failed to develop a writing system. Both were ruled by dynasties. Brianna, what do we think? Both were ruled by dynasties. Good job. That's exactly right. Which of the following is a religious difference between the Huang River civilization and the other great river civilizations? Um, its people believed their king was a god. Its king made use of oracle bones to communicate with their ancestors. The Huang River civilization did not develop a strong religious beliefs. The Huang civilization developed a concept that rulers had the support of the gods. Nicholas, what do we think? B. Good job, right? They, they use their oracle bones um, to communicate with with neighbor, or with the ancestors. Okay, which of the following were contributions of the Shang's dynasty's craft people? So was it silk making and bronze casting, bronze casting and iron working, jade carving and gold working, stone sculpting and steel making? Mackenzie Lynn, what do we think? C. C. Okay, so they don't really talk too much about gold um, in this reading, but that's not that's not a bad guess. Um, let's see, Alejandra, what do you think? A. A is correct. Good job. So where were the or where did the earliest Chinese writing appear? Was it on silk cloth? Was it on jade animal sculptures? Was it on oracle bones or was it on animal hides? Adan. C. It was on oracle bones. Good job. And what is the most likely explanation for why the Shang had such little interaction with non-Chinese cultures? They were unable to travel upon the Yellow River. They were surrounded by desert plains and mountains to the north and west. Uh, they were not aware of other cultures existing, and they were unable to use the seas to establish trade due to lack of technology. Let's see. Rhea, go ahead. B. B. He's correct once the slide moves. There we go. OK, good. All right, so we're going to move on now to the to the next section. Um, and this is kind of talking about the dynasties. Now, what this section does is it kind of gives you an overview of not just 
all the dynasties, but it also kind of tells you about the next kind of dynasty and a half, okay? Um, so just kind of um, try to follow along with me here. Um, I don't think this part is too hard. There's one slide at the end that's actually really, um, really important. Um, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time on that slide, okay? All right, so the Chinese dynasties. So the rise of the Zhou dynasty. So it's pronounced kind of like the name Zhou, right? So Zhou dynasty. Um, so the Shang dynasty started out with kind of good, a good fair leader. Over 550 years, the rulers were not so good to the people. The last one, Di Xin, um, kind of tortured and oppressed everyone um, who was noble. And he played favorites among the nobility. And this caused the nobility to kind of fight with each other. Um, so King Wu of the, of the Zhou saw problems, right? And he decided to kind of seize control. He met with almost no resistance. So the Shang Dynasty falls when one of the members of the nobility from the Zhou family kind of decides he's gonna take over. Nobody resists him. Um, in order to build more support, Wu and his people ordered, um, or, or sorry, opened prisons, freeing the prisoners, and he also gave them food from the city's granaries to help local people. He even took the riches from the palace and gave them out to the soldiers and the people for rewards. So this kind of began a new dynasty, and what you're gonna see throughout the history of um, China is that there's this cycle, right? A dynasty comes into power, they kind of lose that power. Something happens where a new dynasty takes over. They rise to power, they take over. So the, that kind of cycle happens throughout Chinese history. So the Zhou kind of um, argued that they had been given control of the country because of the mandate of heaven. Now, this stated that the overthrow of the Shang was not the, um, the overthrow of the Shang was the will of the gods. And as long as the um, will of, the, as long as it's part of the will of the gods, they would continue to rule. So the reason why a dynasty is kind of in, in charge is because that's what the gods want. Once the, the, that mandrake is good or lasts as long as kind of the kings or the emperors are ruling well. So once they continue, once they stop ruling well, then that mandrake goes away. And then it's kind of okay to overthrow that, that current dynasty and put a new one into place. So this dynastic cycle kind of shows that the, the, how the mandrake of heaven could kind of expand and change um, leadership. So you have kind of the, the, a new dynasty kind of comes in and restores peace um, kind of protects its citizens and builds its infrastructure. And then the new dynasty kind of becomes an old dynasty over time. And that means that kind of the, they start to overtax their citizens, their protection weakens, um, there's kind of a decline in their infrastructures, there's lots of injustices. So that means that that, that dynasty that was new and now is old loses their mandate of heaven, right? They're no longer, it's no longer God's will for them to be in control. So usually there's some kind of disaster, whether it's a natural disaster, right? Um, um, uh, uh, monsoon or something, right? There's a revolt or they get invaded from somewhere. Some kind of disaster happens and that's when a new dynasty will kind of step in and claim power, claim that mandate of heaven and that new dynasty comes on, comes on in. So you can see there's kind of that, that cycle. So we're going to talk now about some of those, some of those dynasties, but really the, the Zhou dynasty is one of the, it may even be the longest running dynasty in Chinese history. So the Zhou dynasty lasts for 825 years, right? So we're getting close to a thousand years they, they, they rule China. Now, like Greece, it's not just one large area, right? It's, it's really much they run their dynasty in like a city-state fashion, much like the Greeks did. So they kind of had, instead of um, one large territory, they had kind of separate towns and villages, more than a hundred of them. The Zhou did not rule these territories directly. They controlled their territories by setting up local rulers who owed their power to the Zhou dynasty. So basically it would say, you know, you owe us a favor. So you're, you know, you're, you're loyal to us, to us. So you're going to go rule this little town. This guy over here, he's loyal to us. So he's going to go rule this little town over here. Okay. So each town kind of had their, their autonomy and that really allowed them to last for a long time, um, 825 years. So in the later era of, of the of the Zhou, the last hundred years or so, was a time of general good health and prosperity. And it was during this time that China really started to develop their silk industry, their iron, and their bookmaking. Um, they also saw the rise of some major movements that we're going to talk about, Confucius and the Tao. Um, so the Eastern Zhou um, ter territories began to attack each other. And after many years of battle, all the smaller villages were consolidated into just kind of six uh, areas. 
So when these revolts are happening, it's kind of when the Zhao lose their, man, their mandate of heaven. So after the fall of the Zhou, a new dynasty uh, takes power, and that's the Qin. The Qin began um, work on one of China's most famous structures, the Great Wall of China. The dynastic cycle continued for over a thousand years. After the Qin comes the Han dynasty, then the Tang, then the Song, then the Ming dynasties. Each dynasty made kind of advancements in ideas, technologies, and eventually China became a unified empire. Jonathan, go ahead. Um, wasn't China also the one that discovered gunpowder? Yep, we're going to get to that. Yeah, yep. Okay. Um, so here's the slide I was talking about that's actually kind of an important slide. Um, but you can find this in your module of readings as well. This is going to help you for your 7.02 assignment. Um, basically, this kind of gives you the, the so this, this part of our lesson really is going to talk about the Shang and the Zhao dynasty and a little bit of the Qin dynasty. Next time we're going to talk in great length about the Qin dynasty and move into the Han dynasty. And then in module eight is when we're going to talk about the Tang, Song, and Ming dynasties. So all these dynasties are coming, but just to kind of give you an idea, these are the major dynasties in um, in Chinese history and some of the things that they're known for doing. So we talked about how the Shang dynasty had their early Chinese writing and bronze casting, while the Zhou dynasty was into irrigation, right? Silk making, um, the analytics we'll talk about in the next section. Um, book making, Confucius, the Tao, and legalism, all we're gonna talk about in the next section. The Qin, the, the, sorry, the Qin dynasty is kind of, they come up with common laws and money, um, kind of uh, built lots of, lots of roads, the terracotta army, like my little soldier guy back there, right? He's the terracotta army, um, which we'll talk more about next time. But the Qin dynasty is important because it unifies all of China into one kind of giant empire. The Han dynasty, they're known for casting iron, they're, they're um, stirrups, inventing stirrups, the iron plow using civil service. Let's see, they're into porcelain, paper making, um, a wheelbarrow, uh, acupuncture, a compass, even a hot air balloon comes from the Han dynasty. The Tang dynasty, they have kind of um, a canal system, gunpowder, like Jonathan mentioned, um, kind of block printing. They even do a smallpox vaccine, and they're also the first um, group of Chinese to really start drinking tea. The Song Dynasty, they're um, the first ones to come up with noodles, right, and start um, using noodles for food. The spinning wheel, calligraphy, landscape paintings, and then the, the Ming Dynasty is really known for kind of um, their blue and white porcelain. You may have heard of Ming vases or vases. Um, operas and dramas, poetry, detective stories, okay, that kind of thing. So um, how are we doing on time? I think we're actually doing okay. So why don't we go ahead and, and kind of look through um, these slides. So we're going to try to do this quickly um, like I said, I don't want to get too bogged down in this. Um, so in the in the Chinese dynasties, right, let's look at this first one, landscape paintings. Does anyone remember where I just said landscape paintings went to? Jonathan, what did we say? Wasn't it the, it was either the Song or the Min Dynasty. So it was the Song Dynasty, good, perfect. Um, so then, um, let's see, next we're gonna look at acupuncture. Does anybody remember which one I said that one was? Maria, do you remember? Yes, I believe it was, so it was ac acupuncture. Um, I'm thinking, I believe it was the, um, the Quin, the okay. QIN dynasty. It's the Han dynasty, so the one just after that, so it was close. Um, oh. But that's okay. I like that you raised your hand. Thank you. Um, let's see. And I'm like I said, I'm not overly concerned with this one um, as far as, because I know we just talked about it briefly, but I think it's a good idea to kind of go through them all. So Confucius, where does Confucius come in? Uh, Raya, do you know? Hmm. I think it was the... Zhou Dynasty. Good, the Zhou Dynasty. Good job. That's exactly where it comes in. We're going to talk about them on the next in the next section. Noodles. When did they start eating and making noodles, Luis? Song Dynasty. Good job. You guys picked up on that. Good. Early Chinese writing. Where does that fall in? Um, let's see. Nicholas, what do we think? <clears throat> The Shang Dynasty. Good, from the very beginning. Um, um, is Shanghai uh, named after the Shang Dynasty? Is what? I'm sorry? Shanghai. 
Oh, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I have no idea, to be honest. It's possible. Um, let's see. The common money and laws. So what did we say was the one, that, the, the one who really unified the country and came up with common money and laws? Um, let's see. Grace, what do we think? The Qin Dynasty? Good, the Qin, like this. <laughs> Qin Dynasty. So actually, if you think China, Qin, the, the, the name of the country actually comes from the, the, the Qin Dynasty. Um, but good, great job. Um, okay, and the next one is um, kind of blue and white porcelain. We talked about their, their, their vases, their vases. Uh, let's see. Mackenzie, what is it? The Tang Dynasty. Okay, so when you think of, of porcelain, you want to think of the Ming Dynasty, but that's okay. Good, good job. Um, let's see. Next is opera and drama. Adan, what do you think? Oh, put your hand down as soon as I called you. That's okay. Um, let's see. A lot, a lot of less confident people here, but that's okay. Brianna, what do we think? The Ming Dynasty. Good job. That one's also the Ming. The Ming are known for their arts, right? Oops, sorry, I just hit the, the wrong button. Anyway, the terracotta army, like the guy behind me, right? That's that's from um, the Qin Dynasty as well. Emperor Qin was buried with a bunch of these guys, which we'll talk more about next time. Um, let's see. That, that one, sounds creepy. That really does sound creepy. It's not. Creepy. It's actually really kind of impressive when you see it. All right, so the smallpox vaccine. Which which um, dynasty actually was known for um, kind of vaccinating people? Uh, let's see, Anya, what do you think? The Tang Dynasty. Good job. All right, and then gunpowder. Which which dynasty was known for inventing gunpowder? Um, let's see. Maria, what do you think? I think it's the Tang Dynasty. Good job, the Tang Dynasty. And then bronze casting. Which one is known for bronze casting? Uh, Jonathan, do you know? Um, I'm gonna go with the Han Dynasty. So bronze casting is actually way back in the Shang Dynasty, so the very first dynasty. And then silk making. Who's which one was known for really developing the silk industry? Adon, what do you think? Uh, Zhao Dynasty. Good job. And then obviously. The Hydra Balloon then belongs to the Han Dynasty. Okay, good job. You guys did well with that for just kind of going over it real quickly. I appreciate that. Okay, so um, next question. Which which of these describes what the dynasties believed about the Mandrate of Heaven? It could determine whether or not they stayed in power. It could be used to control the people during time of revolt. It would be altered according to the Emperor's pre preference. It could be changed as needed or ignored altogether. Um, Brianna, what do we think? A. I agree. Good job. That determines whether or not you stay in power. How did a dynasty lose or gain the mandrate of heaven? If the ruling dynasty was wealthy, it would keep the mandrate. Um, if the ruling dynasty was fair, it could keep the mandate. If the ruling dynasty was weak, it would lose the mandate of heaven. If the ruling dy dynasty was not spiritual, it would lose the mandate of heaven. Alejandro, what do you think? I think it's D. OK, so it's not quite D. Um, let's see. Maria, what do we think? I think it's B. B. Good. So if, if, as long as they're fair, they can keep that, that mandate of heaven. If they're, once they become an unfair, unjust dynasty, then they're going to lose that, and it's time for a new dynasty to come in. Which dynasty came up with the early Chinese writing system called um, pictographs or ideographs? Joe. C. C, the Shang Dynasty. Good job. Uh, which dynasty began work on the Great Wall of China? Um, let's see. Rhea, what do we think? Um, B. OK. So it's not B. Um, like I said, it's the, the same one who kind of brought China all together in, in unified China. Um, so which one is it? What do you think? The Quin? Chin? Good. 
There we go. All right. And let's talk really quick about your assignment for this for this one. Um, so this one kind of has they're asking to make a digital poster. Most kids just kind of give it to me on a on a PowerPoint or on a Microsoft Word document. I'm really OK with whatever you want to give me as far as the program you use. But it says China made many contributions in the world's foods, art, sciences and medicine. Um, which Chinese contributions do you think is the most important and why? For this assignment, you will be asked to choose the five contributions from Chinese dynasties and rank them in order of importance. You have to explain why you rank them the way you did. And to do this, you must reflect upon how the contributions you chose affected the ancient Chinese civilization. Because we just went over a whole bunch of them, right? Um, all you need to do is pick five of those. So as far as the steps go, it says, choose five of the ancient Chinese contributions named in the lesson. Then you want to find one image to go along with each one. Then you want to display the contributions and images in a digital poster um, in order from. Um, I'm only seeing slide 70. It's just showing questions. Then you'd want to sign out and sign back in. Um, so you'd want to um, kind of um, rank them from the least popular to the to the or the least important to the greatest importance. OK, so some kids guys are forgetting that kind of ranking system. Make sure you do that. OK, make sure you make it very clear. This one is the least important of the five. This one is the most important of the five. OK, um, and make sure you have a picture for each one. You want to write a one to two paragraph explanation that tells why each contribution was chosen and why that contribution gets the particular rank that it does. OK, so you want to tell me that I've, I've chosen this because this is how it contributed to society. You also should probably tell me guys what dynasty it comes from. OK, and that should be pretty easy to do if you go back and reference that chart. OK. So that's pretty much that assignment in a nutshell. I think the the thing that's getting kids most tripped up uh, is the whole thing about making sure that you write a good paragraph explanation. Um, Jonathan, turn off your camera, please. Um, you, you want to make sure that you um, give me that full that full paragraph description, and you want to make sure that you um, kind of make it very clear as to why you're choosing it and in which rank it is. Um, Ray, do you have a question about this assignment? Okay, so. Let's move on to our last section, and that's the ancient Chinese beliefs. So, ancestors and gods, this is kind of the cornerstone of their beliefs, right? Because ancestors were important to the Chinese people, they worshiped them like gods. Ancestors were thought to be very wise. The people believed that dead ancestors had the power to shape the lives of those that they left behind. The Chinese people also believed in several different gods. These gods were not um, ancestors. Instead, they were um, often related to nature. So these gods would kind of be in control of the weather, such as wind and rain, and they were also the gods of directions like north, south, east, and west. In ancient China, people believed that the ancestors and gods were connected. They would talk to one another, and they thought that ancestors could persuade the gods to be kind to those that were living. Um, for example, an ancestor might talk to the god of rain so that it would not bring too much rain um, to the people. Uh, people believed strongly that the gods would be um, angered, so an angry god would bring about destruction on Earth. Ancestors were um, the kind of living's only hope for keeping the gods happy, right? So you can kind of, you talk to the gods through your dead ancestors. Um, so the classical period of ancient China, so um, changes to China's belief system were surely not quick. They took place over a long period of time, and this period of time is, is often called the classical period. This period is known for its growth and its creativity. So during the period, during this period, um, China had several great philosophers. Uh, their writings kind of helped shape China's culture. So uh, three dynasties or kingdoms made up of this time period, this classic time period in China. Um, there was the, the Zhou dynasty, the Qin dynasty, and the beginning of the Han dynasty. Um, during these three dynasties, the country grew in size, but changes also happened in the Chinese government and in their economy. A lot of this deals with their bureaucracy. Now, bureaucracy is kind of like the people who make up the government. OK, so maybe not necessarily the ruler, but all those people below that kind of do the everyday workings to keep the government running. Jonathan, yes, you have a question? 
Yeah, I do. It was about the last thing talking to your ancestors, talking to the guys to your ancestors' dead body parts. This sounds weird. It wasn't through their dead body parts. It was just it was just praying to your ancestors, um, and they're the ones that would go talk to the gods for you. I don't know where you got body parts because it was just it was just them praying for it. The oracle bones weren't weren't their actual ancestors' bones, right? They're like tortoise shells and things. So just make sure you don't make sure you're not too confused on that. Um, so the Chu, who ruled part of the Zhou dynasty, is kind of the the group of people that ruled in the Zhou dynasty. They decided that kings um, should no longer give land to nobles. Instead, they set up a system of a bureaucracy. This meant that the kings appointed people to leadership roles in government. Land was divided to special areas called counties. So the Chu, the Chu kings kind of um, chose people to lead those counties based on their skills. Other leaders during this time decided that a system of um, virtues was not working. These leaders thought that society needed a set of written laws to keep order. These new ideas angered some of the Chinese people. Important thinkers such as Confucius disagreed with the Jew. Uh, Confucius believed that um, making families the center of society would help them bring back order. So essentially guys, the, the Chinese are big on not just giving land to people because it's been inherited. They wanna give it to people who are kind of the most qualified or capable. So Confucius is probably the most well-known um, ancient Chinese figure. Um, Confucius is one of China's um, most famous philosophers. He saw many things he did not like about Chinese society. He began to think about ways to improve it. As a boy, Confucius was not allowed to go to school because he was poor, but he was determined to learn all that he could. He went to work for a nobleman who traveled. The nobleman took Confucius with him on his travels. Confucius became known as the smartest man of his time, and he began to privately teach anyone who wanted to learn. Confucius thought that people were part of five important relationships. Okay, so he, he, every human is part of, of these five relationships. King to subject, right, meaning ruler or, or subjects. Father to son. Husband to wife. Older brother to younger brother or friend to friend. Okay, so as, as a person, you're gonna, you have these relationships with everyone, okay? Y your relationship with another human is gonna fall somewhere in one of those five categories. Confucius pushed people to build good relationships in these five areas. In doing so, society would become strong, okay? Make sure that you do, make sure you have a great relationship with your father, with your wife, with your younger and older brother, with your friends, okay? Confucius wrote down his ideas and thoughts. Um, his followers later put his ideas into one book, called the Analects. Um, the group of Confu or is a group of Confucius writings. They explain how Confucius um, thought people should live and treat one another. Confucianism is not a religion, but it's more of a way of living. Um, respect for oneself and for others is really at the heart of Confucianism. So the next big one is Taoism. Um, so um, kind of, uh, Lazoe was kind of the, the another teacher who lived at the same time as Confucius. And um, like Confucius, Lazoe kind of also wrote down his beliefs. Uh, his book of teachings was known as the Tao Te Ching. Um, Taoism or Taoism is the name of the kind of religion, if that's what you want to call it, that kind of that he began. Its name means the way or the path. Unlike Confucius, he thought that a person needed to do more than just be kind to his fellow man. He believed that both living and non-living things have kind of a force. Um, it was through kind of connecting with this force that um, he finds happiness. And he thought that the idea of uh, Wu Wei or letting nature take its course. So the yin and the yang is kind of the big, the big um, symbol from Taoism. And he kind of believes that every living thing has a life force. The force kind of has two sides known as the yin and the other is the yang. The image on the screen shows the classic yin yang symbol. So the yin um, is the dark side included uh, kind of women, the moon and death. The yang or the light side kind of included men, the sun, rivers and birth. So for everything in nature, there's kind of a, um, there's kind of an opposite force that goes with it. So. Um, a man is something that comes in nature, so the woman is the opposite force, right? Daylight is something that occurs in nature, so darkness is kind of the opposite force. Um, so life should be um, kind of protected at all costs. 
Therefore, people should try to avoid war and killing each other. Some people practice both Confucianism and Taoism because they're not really the same thing. Confucianism teaches kind of how to act towards other people, while Taoism teaches how to act towards oneself and nature. Okay, so they kind of can work together and not necessarily are competing views. And then the, finally, the third big belief that comes out of China is this notion of legalism. So the first emperor of um, the Qin was known as Qin Shi Hugai, um, and he was kind of the first emperor who took power. His advisors encouraged him to follow the teachings of Confucius. Um, however, much like Emperor Qin was, he kind of didn't listen to people. And um, he kind of didn't go along with his group of advisors, and he adopted a, a, a system called legalism. Legalism is a system where there's very strict laws that are followed, and it also uses a bureaucracy. The emperor believed that the government should have strict control. Um, I'm sorry, the emperor should have strict control of the government. He divided China into 36 provinces or districts. Uh, everyone rich and poor followed his code of law. He also set up a police force used um, to kind of give out harsh treatments when laws were not being followed. People who did not follow the laws were quickly um, and brutally punished. Emperor Qin did not believe that the people should question the law. If a person had ideas on how to improve the government, he was smart to keep it to himself. Telling someone how to improve the government could mean a death sentence. Um, a spy system was set up to make sure that people obeyed his rules. Um, it was kind of the duty of citizens to tell anyone who was not obeying the law, right? It was, it was expected that you snitched, essentially. Um, those who did not tell were punished. The emperor had a great power because people feared being punished. The emperor took land away from the nobles. He thought that if the nobles got too much power that they would try to kind of overtake the government. And he did not give land to the poor, but he kept it for himself. The emperor also thought that books were useless. He ordered books to be burned, um, and this is known as censorship. The only books that he saved were books on medicine and books on farming. Okay, so ancient um, Chinese beliefs. So let's go ahead and do this pop quiz section and then we'll be, we'll be done. So if a farmer in ancient China wanted rain, um, why might he pray to his ancestors? Let's see, is it they believe that the ancestors could talk to the gods? They believe that the ancestors had total control of the weather. They believe that ancestors um, could cause destruction if, if not honored and thought um, it was thought that ancestors brought good luck to farms. Brianna, what do we think? A. I agree, good job. What does Taoism, or how does Taoism compare with Confucianism? Confucianism teaches how to act towards others, and Taoism teaches how to act towards oneself and nature. Confucianism says rulers should provide people with basic needs. Taoism says the rulers should create a social structure. Confucianism values nature and human relationships. Taoism dealt with strong leaders and their methods. Confucianism addressed how rulers should behave towards their subjects. Taoism dealt with humanity and family relationships. Uh, Lewis, what do you think? C. C, okay. So that's not a bad one, um, but it's, it's not a bad guess, I should say, but it's actually not the right answer. So let's see. What do we think? Um, Alejandro, what do you think? A. A. Good job. So Confucianism deals with how people interact with each other, and then Taoism teaches about how you should act towards yourself and nature. So what's the significance of the yin-yang symbol? So it depicts Chinese character and oracle bones from ancestral worship. It expresses each of the relationships found in the ideas of Confucianism, it symbolizes the two sides of, of um, the life force taught by Laozi, and it reflects the um, how ruler and subjects were linked to the teachings of legalism. Jeremiah, what do we think? A. Okay, so it's actually not about um, oracle bones, um, but that's not a, not a bad guess. Kaysen, what do you think? C. D. Good job. Great. That's exactly right. 
And then which, um, which of these describes the kind of rise in use of legalism in China? The belief that warring states could only be controlled through respect, the belief that adopting a system of strict laws and punishment would keep order, the belief that the nature of man is evil and strict laws would make men good, the belief that only being in harmony with nature could keep order in China. Nicholas, what do we think? B. I agree, good job. And then who united China, became China's first emperor and established legalism? Mackenzie, what do you think? Okay, Anya, what do you think? It was um, C. C, good. Emperor King. And how does the bureaucracy system change in ancient China? Um, it leads to violent uprisings across China. Um, it moves people away from appointed nobles to qualified people. It allows for more a more democratic system to develop. It brings about an end to the Shang dynasty. Uh, Lewis, what do you think? C. Okay. So for this one, it's actually going to be um, moving power from kind of those that are just appointed to those that are actually the most qualified. Okay, so let's talk about um, the next two assignments and then we'll be, we'll be just about done. So um, for assignment 7.03, it actually gives you a chart. The chart looks like this, okay? And it's actually quite simple. You just need to um, describe some of the major beliefs in ancient of the ancient Chinese philosophers. So you're going to be looking at Confucianism, Taoism, and legalism. So those are the three you're going to be kind of looking at. Um, and then you just follow the directions to complete the chart. So it's going to ask you things like, you know, how, how would you define this philosophy? Which philosopher is associated with these? Um, kind of what is the role of family under these philosophies? So you just have to, have to kind of dive deep into each of these three beliefs. The readings give you a lot more information than this um, slideshow did. So you have to really dive into those readings. Um, in 7.03 and look at those three major belief systems, okay? When you're done with the Chinese uh, beliefs chart, you need to then answer the reflection questions in at least three sentences, okay? Make sure you do at least three sentences. I'm having to send a lot of assignments back because kids aren't hitting the minimum length requirements, okay? Any questions on 7.03 before we move into the 7.03 advanced? Mackenzie, questions? What if it, the symbol wasn't black and white? What if it was like blue and pink? Well, I think I think then it would as long as as long as the belief stood for the same thing. I don't think the color is overly relevant. I was just asking because I have a necklace of it. Yeah, I mean, if if it's a legitimate yin yang, then it won't it won't be anything but black or white. But I mean, I suppose you could change the colors. Um, okay, Lewis, what's your question? Okay, so then real quick, the, the um, um, 7.03, the advanced assignment, kind of gives you a quote. It gives you a quote from each of the three Chinese philosophers, Confucianism, Confucianism, Taoism, and legalism. You need to research each quote and find out how it influences the beliefs of people today in China. You're gonna write three paragraphs, one for each one of those quotes, and each paragraph should include um, the quote and, and, the, and the paragraph, right? Answering each of the three questions. Once again, this isn't overly difficult of an assignment, um, but it will take you a little bit of time. Remember, this is if you're advanced only. Okay, you don't have to do this unless you're taking it for advanced credit. Okay, and you have the learning goal. Once again, hopefully you guys are at least at a three now. Maybe you worked your way up from a one to a two. That'd be great too, but, but our goal is to have everyone at a three, okay? Can you kind of explain the contributions of the Shang Dynasty, interpret the importance of family, describe the teachings of Confucius, and um, the yin, the yin yang? Okay, thank you guys. If you have any questions, I'll stick around for a minute. If not, you can go ahead and, and, and sign out. Um, looks like we made it exactly under an hour, so that's good. Bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. 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 This is perfect. Bye, guys. Bye. Mr. Privatera. Bye. Bye. I have a question. Sure. Why do we have, I just was wondering, why do we have to learn about this stuff? Because the state of Florida says you must. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the way answer. I think, um, so lots of times with history, you, you know, history repeats itself, right? We, we learn about problems that we have today from problems that they had in the past, right? Mm -hmm. so, so as a society, I think that's why, you know, History is one of your your core topics. Okay. okay. Th thank you for doing this. It's very helpful. You're welcome. Thanks. Have a great night or day. You, you too. Both. Bye. Bye, guys.